Superintendent John Fernandez from the Guam Department of Education coming up momentarily, but I wanted to read this uh, message. One of the LinkFam members, a uh, beloved member of our community, Maggie Monroe Anderson, says, I just ordered my test kits. You know, Tomas was showing you earlier. Uh, for, ordered some for my family in Oregon and for the family here on Guam. They're free and they ship here for free. Everyone in each household can order some for themselves. So take it from Maggie. No. Do they uh, ship it through Richmond or no? Oh, boy. <laughs> Then no one thought about that. You, you know, I wish that was an inside joke on Guam, but it's yeah. like if you've ever tried knows. ordering anything, yeah, the Richmond thing is. With my luck, is I'm going to order it and it's going to get stuck in Richmond. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at 843, Superintendent John Fernandez. Good morning, John. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I don't know where to start. Uh, but did you want to do your thing first and then we'll. Yeah, you know, uh, sorry, I wasn't able to come on last week. I, I want to say it was a slow week, but um, <laughs> as you know, I mean, there's, I mean, there's just never, there's never uh, telling, uh, you know, when the week's gonna, you know, really end, and uh, you know, things settle down for the weekend. So I did want to address. I mean, I think um, something that came to the forefront uh, and was shared, you know, widely in the community uh, was an incident that happened in Southern High. On Friday, it was a riot that broke out between uh, between you know several students on uh, the campus, and you know it's, it's something that uh, of course you've also seen in other schools, uh, especially with students or others uh, video and share that. So um, you know it it was uh, you know of course we 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 always deal with these on a case by case basis, and try to ensure that uh, we deal with the students, the perpetrators accordingly. But uh, you know the concern of Southern High was it was uh, serious enough for a student to uh, need to be transported to the hospital. Uh, luckily, and uh, for 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 him that um, you know he was able to be released that uh, that evening. But you know that just reminds us that you know even if uh, you, even if you aren't fighting, even just horse playing, you know, there are things, there are consequences to to falling, uh, you know, hitting your head. Um, you know, other, you know, other ways you might be endangered. And we certainly don't like to see any of our students, you know, end up at the hospital. So I did, um, you know, send a, a, a message out to our community and but really to our administrators. And that is that, you know, not only during a normal year, but especially this year, as we're trying to get students back to, uh, to a safe environment for teaching and learning, that we have to really remind uh, everybody that there is no room for violent, violent activities on campus. And under our board policy, that doesn't just mean, you know, those individuals who might be fighting, but those who threaten, those who uh, instigate, those who are seen, you know, abetting um, or assisting, you know, everyone is, is subject to consequences. And I've told the administrators, they need to draw a bright line in terms of how they're gonna address these issues in the schools. Um, in the most serious cases, as you know, if a student is uh, recommended for expulsion from, um, you know, from school, the administrator may make their recommendation. There's obviously due process involved. There's a there's a committee um, of, of fellow classmates, teachers, uh, representatives from the central office who meet and hear all sides. But at the end of the day, if that's a recommendation that comes to me, I'm I'm really um, you know inclined to support the administrators and ensure that the message gets out there that, that, that we're not really playing around. We don't have room for violence in the schools um, and, and we don't have uh, the luxury of anybody being endangered and, and, and feeling threatened and, and possibly hurt or hospitalized. So there's a lot going on. So, yeah. you know, that, that, that was the first thing I wanted to kind of communicate. And second, you know, I, I, I spoke to our district psychologist and said, you know, obviously our first, our first, uh, reaction to this was to work with GPD and and uh, and our mayors and so forth to really uh, make sure that you know the, the campus is safe. So yesterday they instituted a blanket search, uh, made sure that nobody was bringing in weapons, uh, provided extra monitoring for students, and that uh, type of you know activity will continue. But I did also reach out to uh, you know our district psychologists, our lead psychologists here in the department to ask what they're learning about other districts that are reopening and whether they are seeing any of you know these types of behaviors increasing as a result of you know uh, kids in isolation and you know now coming back to school and the reason i the reason i did that was because we in a, in a couple of these incidents not just at southern but you know and elsewhere um they seem to be the you know the freshmen and, and sophomores uh, at the school and
and, and of course, you know, over the last two years, these freshmen and sophomores would have been, you know, seventh or eighth graders during a year where they would not be in, you know, were, were having their uh, teaching and learning disrupted, may not have been in school, and now coming back into a high school setting, uh, it concerns me that the that the younger students uh, in in high school are, you know, creating all this havoc, and not just, you know, and this is of course is only a minority, you know, of our of those students, but uh, nevertheless serious enough that we need to just get ahead of it and make sure that uh, they understand there are consequences to their actions. So, um, you know, that'll be an ongoing thing. I do want to. So that's the the first thing I wanted to start off with. Uh, I know this will come up later. I, I saw the the governor's announcement yesterday for law enforcement pay raises, and I just want to, I know it'll come up in our conversation, but I just wanted to address it up front that uh, yes, uh, an educator uh, pay adjustment is uh, being discussed. Um, you know, here at, here at GDOE, and of course uh, with the administration and, and the Department of Administration specifically, um, over the past couple of years, uh, I, know that, I know that the administration had prioritized doing a, an educator wage study as part of its uh, you know, campaign platform. And then this year, uh, Senator Nelson, you know, in, in the Appropriations Act, you know, directed us to move that forward, you know, whether it's, in, you know, whether in partnership or on our own. So uh, last week we were able to, to meet with the governor and uh, her team. And uh, there, there is, uh, you know, there is uh, sentiment to, to move ahead and uh, get the uh, recommendations of our, uh, you know, of our, of our staff, you know, that looks at the salaries and, and looks at what it'll take to bring them to market and put a proposal on the table so we can evaluate that and determine whether that's feasible to address, you know, the, uh, the educators. I mean, as you know, over the last two years, it's been very tough to be, uh, to be a teacher, um, especially for those uh, who have, you know, who are, you know, fearful of COVID-19, uh, those who've had to deal with the switch to distance learning, um, and, and all the additional responsibilities that come along with with that, and then even even today, just dealing with um, you know with this uh, shortage. You know, we're starting to see the the disruption of co of the quarantine and isolation protocols and so forth. So it's been a a very taxing year, and and so um, you know I think uh, this this uh, pay review and and pay adjustment will will try to complete that so we can let the community know you know what the recommendation is. And uh, hopefully we can do that this month because we're in our budget preparation period and we need to, uh, you know, finalize a budget for GDOE. So if there is any adjustment that needs to be made, we want to make sure that it is included in our budget request so that the legislature, you know, can understand what's being proposed. Uh, John, could you just uh, clarify who and how much uh, are we talking about? So we're talking about everyone on the educator uh, pay scale, which means all of our um, yeah, I guess our classroom uh, teachers, uh, you know, our teachers include, you know, not just the classroom teachers, but, you know, librarians, uh, school counselors, and so forth. It also includes school administration. So assistant principals and principals are also included in that, in that pay scale. Um, the school nurses were taken care of uh, with the nurses uh, pay raise that took place uh, late last year. So uh, they will not be included in this review. Uh, but right now, this is mostly your teaching, your faculty positions, uh, teachers and administrators uh, in the department. And the timeline on this, did you say this month? Well, we're hoping to get a at least an estimated uh, a number and uh, have that done uh, by the end of January when we make a, the board is going to need to approve uh, a budget to propose to the legislature, submit to the legislature by the end of January. So. Um, we're going to try to to at least do an initial estimate and uh, provide a basis for that. And there might be some refinement and tweaking, you know, after the fact. But uh, at least when we go to the legislature, we wanted that number to be included. So uh, right now, I, I don't have anything further to share on that, except that we are having our staff kind of work through a briefing for us and give us uh, a range of options to look at and and really a basis for for the adjustment, so that we can, of course, explain it and and have a, re a, a rational approach to this. Um, and then of course, uh, when that number is estimated, well, we wanna include that in our budget. Our budget work sessions actually for the board begin on Friday and then through next week. And then by the, I believe the 28th is uh, the board, the special board meeting uh, where we will, we will address the budget and finalize that proposal uh, to the legislature. 
I told you guys the teachers were next. Can we just talk about that? So, all right. Well, but John, this is something that the governor can't do through an executive order, right? So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we're we're we're, we're a separate agency, yeah. and I'm not sure if she can do it through an executive order or not. But in our conversation, I, you know, this has been an ongoing conversation because I know that this was part of the, uh, you know, her, her her platform when they came on, and um, you know, of course, the pandemic hit. And we were trying to, uh, you know, make room to to address the educators along the way. So um, I think the fact that the nurses were taking care of and law enforcement were taking care of that, she wanted to make sure that she, uh, you know, uh, took stock of where the teachers' uh, pay adjustments were, so we could make sure to address that and not have the the educators wait, um, you know, unnecessarily if there are recommendations that need to be made and and uh, you know figure out how to how we how we pay for it, how we implement it. Uh, so that it's uh, you know at least addresses the concerns and you know gets the helps us with retaining our teachers and hopefully recruiting uh, more to join us. Did you say a, like a percentage or of, of of a raise or even there yet? Yeah, not not there yet. And of course, don't want to don't want to go out there until we're ready because you know once you start, <laughs> you know any change. What's that? He said twenty five percent increase for teachers. <laughs> right, it's a no win situation. Yeah, right, so, uh, right. So yeah, we want to make sure we're careful on, on how that goes. But um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll maybe that's the time frame is the next week and a half. We should have an estimate of what we think it'll take. John, we did. Uh, of course, uh, the comments are, are coming in, and I'm pretty sure uh, I'm surprised we didn't talk about this uh, first. Uh, Michelle comments. I'm sorry, fights are not high in my areas of concern right now. What about the high cases? What are your plans for schools? Uh, considering the high cases, uh, and we're just hearing anecdotally, John, from just a bunch of teacher friends about. Uh, staff and faculty shortages because obviously there's so many people who are not only positive but who are close contact and having to isolate and quarantine. So just, just that whole subject, if you could. Yeah. So that's been a that's been a, a challenge for the last you know week and a half. And so um, I mean one of the one of the challenges is that um, this wave looks completely different from the last wave. I mean it's the same virus, different variant, but um, if I have a I have a chart. That kind of tracks us through COVID, you know, since it began. And this one is off the charts in terms of the number of cases that you see. Uh, I'm very, I'm very pleased and optimistic and hopeful that the uh, that the information that I think public health is relying on from other jurisdictions. I hope that holds true in terms of less severity and and less, you know, lower, you know, a, a shorter hospitalization stays and and you know less, uh, you know, a lower number of uh, severe consequences, because if that's the case, that's the only thing I think that can explain uh, this rapidly evolving guidance that we're receiving, not just from public health, but, but CDC. And so uh, right now our team has been working to um, you know make sense of the, the latest guidance and where it's headed. Uh, we still have our protocols in place at the schools, but right now, you know, we just, uh, we, we, we were, you know, we reviewed the latest guidance from public health, which doesn't require, you know, a clearance form to return to work, uh, return to school, you know, that's in our, that's in our protocols. And we're, you know, we now need to discuss whether or not to remove that because that does then, you know, give us less of a opportunity to get that documentation, but also we don't necessarily want the delays in receiving that, that documentation for our employees. So we're trying to balance the need to keep our schools in operation with, you know, what the guidance is saying. Um, if you look at the latest guidance on students from CDC, they, uh, it, it, they're saying that you know if your students are you know have the primary uh, vaccination series, then consider not quarantining them if they are positive or if they are close contacts actually. And so you know that would fundamentally change you know how we're dealing with students today. So right now we're in, we're kind of in the mid middle of it. What we've done as an interim measure is we're deploying you know our staff from the central offices to assist schools with coverage. Uh, so every every morning uh, we we're, we're getting the, the reports from schools on their staffing needs and are deploying central office staff to assist. But you know this can't go on you know forever. So you know we are reviewing the guidance with our uh, our chief nurse, uh, including the latest guidance, and we want to see if there's any any changes that need to occur. Uh, we, we're trying to balance, of course, the safety at schools with the need to continue to ensure that we have adequate staff for operations. Right. So it's a tough one because the, the guidance that came out starting in December, beginning of January, um, I mean, not just public health, but we're talking about CDC 
level, I think it's confusing all around and the time and the kind of mixed messages, not many mixed messages, but again, you know, it's not as straightforward as, as, as you would think, you know, every, every scenario you have to determine whether they're vaccinated, unvaccinated, got a booster, didn't get a booster or ongoing exposure or the, you know, no, non, you know, uh, you know, no exposure and then, then implement the protocols and there's slightly different all the way around. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And that's a, that's a challenge to, to do when you're trying to implement across you know, 41 schools, 4,000 employees, and uh, 28, 26,000 kids. So um, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. We're hoping that the forecast that this will come and go quickly will, um, will you know, will come true. But you know, again, we're in a, we're in different territory, new territory, right. uh, yeah. once more. Yeah, this variant, John. I mean, it, it, I mean, obviously, you're right. It's off the charts, uh, and in some ways, I mean, outside of like the the, we're not seeing the crazy hospitalizations, but this impact of the staff shortages. And I'll just go back to we know, you know, one business is just shut down for. They said we can't continue this week. Sorry, maybe next week. Restaurants, people are sick. Close contacts can open, right? So there's that price tag with this uh, variant, and I mean that, you know, the only silver lining I can think of, and it's a little early for me. It's a little early in the game to just uh really hang our hat on this you know less severity uh thing because when you do look at the national reports i mean it's hit or miss some places or like peak hospitalizations right and so you just never know what to expect but i do know that guidance or whatever when parents wake up and they see 637 cases the anxiety is it's going to be there right and so uh i guess what would you say well, to, i have to well i have to tell you i mean it's it's it, it, it's exactly and i understand completely yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I understand, you know, where the where the uh, decision to scrap the car score, <laughs> why that was made, because you know, at some point you're looking at cases, the number of cases, as your primary indicator, and you know that when you see the rising cases, it's going to translate into this number of hospitalizations and deaths and so forth. And apparently, I guess that's not the connection they're seeing, and I so I understand uh, why they might have made that decision, um, but you know, for us. You know, we have our dashboard that we're still reporting out, and uh, we know that it creates anxiety because it doesn't fully explain the difference, the differences that might be occurring in this situation compared to Delta. So um, it's uh, it's a tough it's a tough one. I mean, we're really just wanting to make sure that uh, that we have good public health guidance as much as possible. But you know, this particular uh, past four to six weeks, I'm not criticizing the local side. I'm just saying that even on the national level, yeah, it's 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 been very difficult to decipher and that's really i think made it a challenge nationally to to figure out how to address school districts openings closures you'll see the you'll see a whole host of examples across the country some schools shut down some decided you know business as usual the only thing that i think really is is comforting to us is that we're we again we've continued with universal masking yeah. which seems to be a consistent recommendation um We've done high levels of vaccination rates. So when I see peak hospitalizations and, and we see the those peak you know numbers of you know uh, ICU cases, they are happening in states that I don't and I also know haven't made as much progress as we have on Guam. So you know it's again we're still learning. It's new territory, and we're we're going to do our best to just make sure that we can stay safe. But we do want to keep our kids in school as much as possible. Right, uh, John. Uh, we did have a comment here from Lonnie with cloth masks. Uh, you know, there's new guidance on the masks with cloth masks. So they're telling us they're not safe. Is GDOE going to help provide uh, the proper mask mentioned in guidance for the, the students? Like I said, you know, those masks. Um, so there is there is discussion internally about uh, moving to N95 masks and, 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 and assessing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I heard the discussion about this, this issue over the last week, you know, at the national level and you know the the guidance isn't you know as as a hard line as you as they as it was before, and so now they're saying you know N95 masks, but you know if you if you put a surgical mask and a cloth mask together that works, and any mask is better than no mask. I mean, you know it gives us a wide range of right. things to consider, and I, and I and it's hard. I mean I think they're trying to provide flexibility for the community, but for someone like you know for us, you know when you say this is recommended and this is required. You know, it's it's really, you know, not an easy thing to decipher whether something is optional uh, when they say it's recommended, 
Uh, is it really optional? Is it going to compromise safety, or is it something that we can safely, you know, forego and stick with the requirements? So, um, unfortunately, it's you know, I, we have a whole team that works on this to try to decipher and give proper. And we don't want to be in a situation where we're giving, you know, one guidance and then changing it ne the next day and the next week. Uh, I think that'll be even worse. So we're sticking with what we have in place, but we are looking at adjusting it depending on, you know, how the numbers work and how the how the guidance evolves. Uh, you know what? That... I think, oh, just for the just for the person who wrote in. I mean, yeah. uh, just so you know, we are monitoring school staffing levels. We are again uh, providing central office employees to assist where possible, trying to push as many uh, and repurpose as many federally funded. Uh, support uh, staff available to uh, support those schools. Uh, we did let the administrators know that if they get to a critical uh, situation, there is a risk assessment uh, framework in place that if they get to a point where they don't believe they're able to operate safely, that then gets to, to another level uh, where they you know bring that to my attention. Uh, and that was you know that get that brings the potential to close down, you know, or partially close down a school if it gets to that point. Absolutely. So it's not uh, it's not a it's not an impossibility, um, and hopefully we don't get there. But it's gonna, you know, when we're trying to monitor and support the schools as much as we can right now. Uh, wow, that's kind of huge. So in the event you do got to do like a partial um, uh, shutdown, I mean, what what uh, plans do you have in place, and how close would you think we are? Because you know things are happening so fast. Like you know, Monday I had a shoot at a restaurant. Yesterday they're like, oh, we're just gonna close. We can't. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, no, I mean, that's I mean, that's a tough part. So our, our administrators are working hard to sustain operations. Uh, their biggest challenge is, of course, maintaining adequate numbers of faculty and staff. Um, through the midst of this all, we've tried to make sure that we're adjusting to the most recent public health guidance, uh, which does help us provide relief, you know, to the schools by, you know, making, uh, you know, by cutting the, 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 the time frame short and shorter than before. But at the same time, you know, it's not an easy, uh, task when we've been short uh, the school year, you know, based on retirements, resignations, and other things that have, you know, come out come through this COVID nineteen period. So again, you know, we're, we do have, a, but again, you know, I just want to let the the public know that if it gets to that point, we're not just going to go forward and you know as is without uh, any any response. If it gets to a critical point, you know, we'll let the board know, we'll let the schools know that we need them to shut down, and uh, you know that that's something that we're preparing for but uh, hopefully we can avoid. Uh, John, I want to go back to the high uh, case counts, right? And so I, I get it with Dr. Berg and uh, the interview you did with Nestor is that what, what they're really trying to tell us is that we should focus on the hospitalizations and that the high case counts, no matter how alarming uh, they are on the surface, are just aren't what they're really focusing on, right? But at what point does it become, uh, I mean, are you looking at with your dashboard just strictly the hospitalizations. I mean, what do we get like a thousand positives, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, today what we're going to be putting out of dashboard that's going to say that over the seven day past seven days, we've we've been at a peak of 17.8% positivity rate on, a, on an average of over the last seven days. And the, the number of new cases is that is almost at 1600 over the last seven days, which again, is a is a peak um from where we've been you know throughout the past couple of years so i mean clearly that's not what public health is kind of looking at in evaluating um the protocols and so we're, we're working with them to just make sure that you know as we go forward we'll, we're, we're willing to you know stay in touch and, and coordinate to protect the kids and our employees but we are going to need them to to be firm about their guidance when it comes down to to that because at this point it does seem that you know, the lower number of hospitalizations and so forth is allowing us to continue operations as normal. Um, but, you know, should that be, should that guidance change or should there be a, um, you know, a change in that, in that, um, I guess, stand, in that stance, we need to know right away because, you know, we're, we're relying on our, our public health experts to, to guide us uh, through this. I, I appreciate the flexibility that's been given uh, but when it comes down to a health emergency or, you know, then when it comes down to, to compromising health, uh, that really has to be done with uh, the firm leadership and guidance from the public health experts. Uh, we're going to do our best, but 
um, you know, again, that's going to really uh, uh, rely on uh, them giving us the latest information and you know, making some determinations um, on their end as well. If if our protocols are not up to uh, to par with what they see as as needed during this time of emergency. Yeah, yeah people are commenting that you're uh, not answering the question, but let me just kind of like correct me if I'm wrong. What you're saying is that basically we're in uncharted territory where, you know, uh, the high case counts. I mean, we've been trained over the last couple of years to just pay attention to that metric, how many positives we have. And that's not the focus of the CDC or public health. Um, and yeah, so, so basically me, you're just keeping me, an I eye on it. Okay, go ahead. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, based on the numbers and based on what we're seeing, I'm following very closely, what the public health experts are guiding us and are in how they're guiding us. And based on CDC and public health guidance, as it's evolved to this point, it actually provides a more flexible uh, approach to, to responding to the high number of cases. And what I mean by that is in the midst of Omicron, what the CDC is recommending is shorter quarantine, peri you know, quarantine periods, uh, exemptions for healthcare workers. Uh, if you're a, a student who's masked, uh, within three to six feet of an infected person who's also masked, you're not a close contact, you can stay in school. And that if you're a student who's been, who's received your primary series of, of uh, vaccinations, then you don't even need, you may not even need to quarantine. So uh, the situation with Omicron, if you're looking at the chart, looks like it's a much, much worse situation from an apples to apples comparison with uh, where we were with Delta in terms of the numbers of new cases. But the guidance that's out there, which I think is creating this, this you know, anxiety, the guidance out there really is more is is more in, in, uh, along the lines of saying that we're kind of out of the more serious phases of of COVID nineteen, and that we can continue to operate. So that's the reason we are, we're keeping schools open. Uh, we do think that it is important that kids go to to school five days a week if they're if we can do so safely. Public health is saying we can do it safely. CDC is saying we can do it safely. I mean, the guidance has gotten less restrictive, you know, from the standpoint of what the public health experts are saying. So the question is, what are we doing? Are there any changes? Uh, what we're saying is we are following the guidance, which allows us, um, in fact, it you know, moved in the direction of being able to continue operations, um, you know, with less quarantine period, with less uh, restrictive measures in place. So I think the only thing I'm saying is that um, we're gonna follow that guidance if our public health experts, you know, see information, see research, see data that says, hey, what, you know, go the other way, they need to let us know because what we're doing is we're relying on their guidance and making uh, decisions based on, uh, on, on, the, on public health expertise. So I think, I hope that answers the question that, you know, we're not, we're not at this point contemplating any uh, re more restrictive measures that are currently being uh, uh, provided by public health. I think the only concern that we have uh, that could affect operations is the issue that you brought up, Chris, which was if staffing becomes affected because of quarantine and isolation, and we don't have enough teachers and staff in school, uh, are we? Are, you know, will that will that uh, affect our decisions to keep uh, schools in operation? Yes, that is a that is a key factor. And for now, we have an interim you know, measure of support that we're providing. But if it does get worse, and some schools, you know, call in and report that they had just you know, they, they are, are at a point where they cannot safely operate uh, in terms of supervision, in terms of, you know, uh, again, uh, being in the classroom to, to, to supervise and teach kids. Uh, at that point, we will consider, you know, those schools needing to, to close uh, temporarily. But we're not at that point yet. And that would be due to an operational, you know, issue that, that could be impacted by COVID, yeah. but really is, you know, uh, really is uh, an issue of not having enough employees at the school. To um, you know, to operate safely um, and supervise our students. Yeah, that's so interesting, John. That it would be uh, operational and staffing um, issues that would shut the schools down, not necessarily the virus itself. Uh, it's like a yeah, and I and I under and I understand it. It's kind of a it is because I'm, I'm I think I'm the same way. It's um, as I read the guidance, I'm waiting for you know Omicron to come and then, and then CDC to say, hey, now we need to shut everything down and do this and do that. And when you watch, when you when you pay close attention to the guidance, it's giving you less restrictive measures. So Omicron's here, but you don't need to quarantine for ten days, right? You know, uh, it's confusing. Or, or you know, it's 
it's confusing yeah. to the to most people, and we're trying to make sense of it and take the most uh, conservative, uh, you know, view that we can, so that we can, you know, safely operate. But you know, it's, I don't think that anybody can say that it's really clear cut, yeah. uh, given what the numbers look like. I mean, and there's been there's been there's that. been criticism that they're changing the guidance to kind of accommodate a lot of the shortages uh, with staffing, right? Well, I've heard I've heard some of that at the national level, yeah. where you know they said things like, "Well, we're we're putting in you know recommendations that we hope people can tolerate." And what, I don't know that that's necessarily the metric that they should be using, but um, <laughs> again, you know. Again, we're trying to uh, figure out who to rely on. So uh, Dr. Ho says still rely on CDC. I'm still doing that. Uh, I'm not Dr. Berg, you know, is influencing public health. Uh, so we're, you know, following public health. But again, all in all, they're going towards a less restrictive uh, environment. At the same time, these numbers are popping. So I can understand the, the you know, your audience saying, what's happening? The numbers have tripled and you, you know, and the, and the guidance is getting, um, you know, more relaxed. Um, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're seeing here too. Yeah. Well, hopefully it, uh, it works out in the end. Uh, John, but I, I want to go back to the staffing just specifically with the, the Southern high fight video. I mean, I, I watched it just outside looking in, uh, was, was any of those, the video, did you see a staffing issue there where maybe there weren't as many staff around as you would like, or, or, cause I know it's just a snapshot. Yeah, no, there wasn't an issue. At, 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 well, you know, this is the administrator is really charged with handling the situation, and, and the concerns there, um, just with Southern, were not really related to staff, uh, staff issues or staff shortages. It's a layout. Um, this is uh, actually this has been something kind of I think bubbling up over the last week, and the, and the staff have been working to de-escalate it. Uh, uh, you know, hearing you know hearing things that might you know uh, disagreements and so forth, and so uh, ultimately. Uh, their efforts to de-escalate it, um, and you know, were were uh, you know were not effective in the sense that um, they actually did anticipate you know the the actual altercation between those individuals. They were working very closely with with others to to try to de-escalate it and, and get them back on a positive track. Um, you know, so there are things that they can do at Southern uh, to address the situation in terms of you know starting to stagger lunch, staggering the. Uh, the periods in which kids are outside, um, you know, in the hallways, and they definitely are, are are looking at that measure. I don't know if they've implemented it, but the administrators uh, can do that in an effort, and we've discussed that in an effort to lower the number of of uh, of kids uh, there. They're they're still investigating it and looking into the dynamics, but um, you know, I think the first impression uh, is that clearly, you know that these these have some basis in the villages so i mean i I think you probably understand that so um you know they are looking at uh, more like village identification of groups who uh, have been involved and are trying to to continue to work with those kids to make sure that they um you know that this doesn't happen again there's no retaliation and so forth uh, John, so, uh, it's a tough job there, but uh, you know we're asking for continued support from from GPD and others to just help us uh, get as much intelligence as we can, so we can you know move forward and make sure don't, this doesn't happen again. Uh, John, did you know anything about Dodea uh, on a pause? I'm sorry, I just saw something in the comments. I don't know if you'd heard about that. Uh, on, on a pause on on what? I don't know. No, you haven't got it. Well, I, I did. I think there might. I, I did hear something about sports. Uh, might have, might be on pause. Okay. But I I don't have any, nothing officially. I did hear that, um, just out there in the community, and you know people are asking about our sports. So um, you know at, at this point we haven't changed operations. But again, uh, when teams if, if a team is affected, uh, they will typically you know go into uh, you know again with quarantine and everything they may forego practices and so forth as a response. And so we've seen that you know at certain schools if an athlete is one of the uh, the cases uh, that might affect uh, the rescheduling of practices and who's able to to join. So uh, it is having an impact, but nothing, uh, no change in the schedule or no shutdown uh, across the board for us. Got it. Thank you, John. Anything else in closing? Um, no. I, again, like I said, uh, you hope for a slow week, but it never is. So <laughs> we look forward to, to, to seeing you next week and hopefully give you more updates on, on what we're doing. Spring break, it might be a little slow, John. I don't, I don't, I don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. John Fernandez, 
DDOE uh, Superintendent, 917. We got to take a break. We're coming back with the KUAM Podcast Network. Uh, we got Kate uh, Baltazar Dodge with a new episode of One with Grief. That's on the way. We're brought to you by Pacific Points, Cabo Enterprises, ITNE, and Jack in the Box. Good morning. We know you're tired of hearing about COVID-19. Some of you are probably wondering whether this is ever going to end. However long it takes, we all have to do our part, including our children, to hold the line. You can protect yourself and your family by getting vaccinated. And if you're already vaccinated, don't let your guard down.